Edict of Nantes. The Edict of Nantes was issued by Henry IV of France to grant the French Huguenots substantial rights in a nation still considered essentially Catholic. Pierre d'Aslan's parents had a high regard for education. As a result, Pierre was educated at Roman Catholic schools, learning French, English, and Latin, and became a priest and served in the diocese of Clermont, France. Pierre became disappointed with developments in France, most likely related to the persecution of the French Huguenots, and renounced his religious affiliation and he fled France around 1721, 35 years old, and went to London, England. The first record of Pierre in London was his marriage to Anne Leroux on January 14, 1722, in the register of the Church of the Artillery in Spitalfields in London. The Huguenot Society of London had established a house of charity for poor French refugees in 1690 in Artillery Lane, Spitalfields. It was for the Huguenots who were fleeing France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The Church of the Artillery is said to have boasted some of the most eloquent French preachers in London. Spitalfield Market still exists today in London, near London Bridge. But the Church of the Artillery has disappeared, and this church has taken its place. On March 21, 1722, just seven weeks after marrying Anne LaRue, Pierre subscribed to the three articles of the 36th Canon of the Church of England and became the parish priest for the parish church at St. Pierre du Bois on the Isle of Guernsey. To become a priest in the Church of England, he had previously become ordained in the church as a deacon and priest, as well as having a dirt popery. Pierre and Anne's only child, Pierre, was born on the Isle of Guernsey on March 16, 1724. Anne died 10 years later without having any more children. 50-year-old Pierre again married in 1735. His wife was 26-year-old Jean Bedat of Bordeaux, France. Pierre and Jean's first child, Louise Charlotte, was born a year later. And on April 4, 1739, Jean's second child, James, was born. Just before James became three years old, his mother died on March 8, 1742. Pierre was left with two small children and a parish to care for. Ten months later, he married for a third time to Anne Lalage. Pierre and Anne had six children. When Pierre married Anne Elijah's first child, Pierre, was almost 19 years old and had become a seaman, so he was not at home when his stepmother died. The three-year-old James had a stern, well-educated father with high ideals for himself, his children, and his parish, and no one in the home to take off the hard edges of his personality. By January 4, 1750, when he was 10 years old, James was no longer living at home, but was apprenticed to and living with a Mr. Mulcallister in London. On that day, Pierre wrote a letter to his son in London. It began without any salutation to James. What I hear of you, unworthy son of such a good father, afflicts me so strongly that I have trouble holding my pen to write you. Is it possible? that after my having given you life, you will give me death through your vile actions. The letter went on for three pages, excoriating 10-year-old James, quoting scripture and telling James how he could please him. He ended the letter by saying, if you wish to regain my affection, make your peace with God, stop the evil, learn to do good as commands the scripture, and renounce your vices and practice virtue and obey your master and be wise, honest, and prudent in your ways. Give me this consolation and I promise you that you will find a father's heart. Don't force me through your libertinage to abandon you. On the contrary, may your conduct in the future lead me to forget the past. This is what the most unlucky of all fathers wishes. And what I recommend to you for the love of God and for the well-being of your soul. Can you imagine a 63-year-old father writing such a letter to his 10-year-old son? 
It is especially touching that James, who had once lived with his father on a beautiful pastoral island, was now living in cramped conditions in dirty, smoky, rainy London. Yet, the letter represents good advice from a father to his son. In the same letter, Pierre told James that if he did not behave, he, Pierre, would go to London and put him on a vessel to the other world, his name for America. I do not know if that happened, but I do know that later, 14-year-old James became a cabin boy on the ship of Captain Daniel, Captain Gibbs of Cape Ann, New England. Apparently, James' apprenticeship had been transferred from Mr. McAllister to Captain Gibbs. I know this because Pierre wrote two letters to James, one dated June 9, 1753, and one dated September 12, 1753. The first was addressed to Mr. James Gaslon at Captain Daniel Gibbs at Cape Ann, Boston, New England. The second letter was addressed to Mr. James Gaslon to Captain Daniel Gibbs in Cape Ann, if by the Boston way to be left with Paul Revoir, goldsmith in Boston. Yes, Paul Revoir. Not the Paul Revere of the famous Midnight Ride of April 18, 1775, because this letter was written 22 years before that ride. Young Paul Revere was only 18 years old at this time, and this letter was written in care of his father, Apollos Revoir. Pierre explained in this letter of September 12, 1753 to James, for some time I have known that Mr. Revoir, who everyone knows here, has a first cousin in Boston, a goldsmith or silversmith by trade in the said Boston. Pierre's tone had greatly changed since his first letter to James. The June 1753 letter began, my poor Jamie, my dear child, I am sure by this time, I'm sorry, and in the September 1750, the June letter began, my dear Jamie, and the September letter began, my dear Jamie, my dear child. I am sure by this time, Pierre had learned a great deal more about America from conversations with the Polish Revoirs, uncles and other French Huguenots who still lived on the Isle of Guernsey and had relatives in America. Pierre almost also made trips to London, where he would have heard many stories about England's American colonies, especially those in New England. In addition to that, he had two sons, Pierre and James, who were seamen, out experiencing a world he did not know. He was aware they knew more about the world than he did, and yet he was sure they were trying to please him. All of that would have softened Pierre towards James. We don't believe James ever visited the Isle of Guernsey or saw his father again, but we do know he became a supercargo or captain. In 1760, James wrote his father from Lisbon, Portugal, saying he was a mate on a ship and had been promised command. Not bad for a 21-year-old man who 10 years before had been living in London and was almost given up on by his father. By the time James had, by this time James had met and married a beautiful Irish girl named Deliverance Annis. James and Deliverance had two children before they bought a small plot of land on the road from Gloucester to Manchester near Freshwater Cove. On March 5, 1765, the deep, on March 5, 1765, I'm sorry. The deed says James was a mariner, and he bought the land from Benjamin Weber, whose farm surrounded it. I'm sure that James very quickly built a house on the land, but just three months later, their third child, Peter, was born on July of 1765. They were to have two more children before they left their home in Gloucester and went to the District of Maine, fleeing the political upheaval in Massachusetts Bay Colony. When James and Deliverance bought their land on Cape Ann, the British Parliament paid, passed a hated stamp act designed to impose a direct tax on the American colonies. You must remember, by this time, James was a ship captain. As a result, he would have had direct responsibility for paying those hated taxes on all cargo he was carrying to and from the American colonies. In the book, Guns Off Gloucester, James Garland writes, 
Daniel Giddings bought or built a dolphin, 60 tons, in 1766, and sped her off to Gibraltar under, the, under Captain James Gass along with rum, candles, and staves. From there, she sailed along the sunny coast of Malaga, loaded raisins and lemons, and was no sooner back at Gloucester, etc. Later, Gallen had added, it seems her colonies had taught England that they were not to be treated as naughty children, that they had the muscle to achieve equal status in the English family and to keep it. Pardon me for being a little slow. On February 26, 1767, the 110 ton brigantine, King of Prussia, sailed out of Salem Harbor with James Gaslon as its captain. At one time, the King of Prussia had carried nine guns. No record indicates James was carrying guns, but we do know that the Sons of Liberty had been very active in opposing the Stamp Act. And even though it had been repealed when James left Salem, the British were still not happy with the American colonies not sharing their wealth with the mother country. The British were still harassing American ships. On May 18, 1767, James wrote to his father Pierre from Malaga, Spain, saying he was in command of a small vessel from 1767 to 1773. All we know of James is through eight letters written to him from the Isle of Guernsey. Seven of those letters were from his father, and the eighth from Jean Godfrey, rector of the parish church of St. Severe, regarding Pierre's estate. Pierre died on September 16, 1772, and was buried in the churchyard of his church called the Little Church in the Wood on the Isle of Guernsey. James was an active American patriot, and he had become a hunted man by the British Navy. He moved deliverance in their five boys to Falmouth, now Portland, in the District of Maine before September 27, 1773. We know this because his first daughter, Lucy, was born in Falmouth on that day. Anecdotal history indicates that James and Deliverance and their six children fled Falmouth and went to Harrisikit. Just before British Captain Moat bombarded Falmouth and burned over two-thirds of the town to the ground in October of 1775. This was just six months after the American Revolution had started at North Bridge in Concord with the shot heard around the world. Three months before the Declaration of Independence, James and Deliverance took their six children to the Indian garrison then known as Lewiston Falls. Even though the locals called this an Indian garrison, James probably felt his family was far safer with the Indians around than in Harrisica with the British and their loyalists sneaking around along the coast of Maine. After all, he knew what he had done to up with, with the British Navy and was probably inclined to not let them return the favor. James soon moved his family from the settlement at the falls and took up land five miles down the Androscoggin River. Here he operated a ferry crossing the river where he and Deliverance kept a public house to entertain travelers. For many years, Gaslon Ferry was the only way to cross the Androscoggin River, and Gaslon's Ferry Road was the only road into to Lewiston Falls. James and Deliverance never, met, never moved again and are considered to be some of the earliest settlers in Lewiston Falls. They increased the size of the settlement by eight people when they moved from Harrisica to Lewiston Falls. <coughs> One week before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, their seventh and last child, Sally, was born on the 27th of June, 1776. James and Deliverance's children all contributed to Lewiston's growth. All of their five sons built homes, married, had children, and died in Lewiston. By September 3, 1783, when John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay signed the Treaty of Paris at 56 Rue Jacobin, Paris, France, making the American colonies the United States of America. James and Deliverance's family in Lewiston Plantation was 10 people. By the time Governor Samuel Adams of Massachusetts signed the charter, incorporating Lewiston Plantation as the town of Lewiston on February 18, 1795. James and Deliverance family had already grown to 38 people.